Thomas, Scorch is a union between, of scikit-learn and PyTorch. So scikit-learn defines a very nice interface for defining machine learning algorithms. You could fit models, predict on it, and it works very nicely. Now, PyTorch, how many of you have used PyTorch? Raise your hands. How many trained at neural network? This is really hard to see everyone. All right, cool. All right, so if you only want to train a neural network with just PyTorch, it's really simple. All you have to do is go through epochs, go through your data, do a forward prop, um, calculate your loss, go do a back prop, and then update your weights, right? Easy peasy, right? What else, what else do you want to do? Well, we want to record metrics, right? So we add code to record metrics. We also, being great data scientists that we are, we like doing validation sets, so we write code to do that too, right? And then we want to record metrics on our validation loss, we want to do checkpointing, we want to record other metrics, we want to do logging. This, this goes on and on of the things you do when you train a neural network. Scorch, ooh, it's a product, it's not a product, it's an open source software that is cycle and compatible that wraps around PyTorch. It abstracts away the training loop and reduces boilerplate code using callbacks. Very similar to Kira's. All right. On the upper level, what does Scorch define as an object? In this case, it defines a neural net object. What a neural net object needs is a module defined in PyTorch to, and also something to optimize over, the criteria. And optionally, you could provide callbacks. We could go through this API without any data, it would be kind of boring. So we're gonna go through three data sets in this, in this talk. We go through MNES, which is a classification problem. Ants versus bees, which is a classification problem, but we're gonna use transfer learning. And then the 2018 Kaggle data science book problem, which is an image segmentation problem. Right? So three different problems, all images, because images are pretty. And yeah, let's start with MNES. MNES, everyone knows. In this case, there, there's 70,000 of them, and they're flattened. Very important to note that these, this data is it, they're NumPy arrays, right? We're gonna use NumPy arrays in PyTorch and with Scorch, and it'll all work, we'll see. All right, so since we all went to pre-K machine learning, we know we have to split our data into training and test set, so we're gonna do that. We can scale data, split the data, and now we have to define our module in PyTorch. We do this by subclassing the module class of PyTorch, and in this case, it's a very simple neural network. It takes in a tensor of size 784 and spits out a vector of size 10. These 10 numbers represent the 10 values of MNES. Now, the 10 values, they're view vector values, so that means they're any value between negative infinity to infinity. And if we want to have a loss function, we have to do the softmax to get probability, we do negative that log loss to get a loss function. PyTorch does this really nicely with something called the cross entropy loss. It does all this magic for you. So now we have the module, we have a criteria, now we could use the neural net object. We place it in the neural net object. What else do we need? How many epochs are we gonna train on? In this case, 10. We set the learner to 0.3, and this is very important, we're gonna put it on CUDA. If that was commented out, it would train on your CPU. So now you have all this set up, how do we train it? Well, you call fit on these NumPy arrays. Internally, it will convert it to PyTorch tensors and do the training loop. It, it records all this information, the, num the epoch number, the training loss, the validation loss, and the duration for each epoch. Let's say you want to continue training. What do you do? Well, you could call set params to, change, to update the number of epochs. In this case, I want to continue training for five epochs. And then we call partial fit because we want to continue training the neural net and we train for five more epochs and we call the same metrics. So this, this all is really nice. So how do you get this to be machine readable? Well, after you train your neural net, there's a history object that you go have that, that is defined. It's gonna have the length of the number of epochs you have. It also supports string indexing. So you could do negative one string indexing, and if you want the final validation loss, this will work. It also supports list splicing. So if you want the final two elements of your training loss, you could just do string splicing. Ooh, all right. <laughs> 
accuracy. Let's say you want to do more than predict, uh, more, more than record the loss. Let's say you want to do accuracy. What do you do? Well, you have a, if you call predict on the known object, it, does, it gives out the raw values of the, no, of the module, the known net module from PyTorch. In this case, 10 values, the 10 real values that are outputted by the known net. So our metric has to understand this. Um, so how do we get the prediction of this real value vector, which is called argmax? And this will predict up and compare it to the true value, and that'll give you the accuracy score. Yeah, you, could put on a, you could do it on the test data set. Now, how do you get scores to record these metrics? Well, how many of you have heard of scikit-learn's make scorer? Yeah, yeah, very popular. <laughs> you could use make score to create a scoring object. <laughs> and what Scorch wants is the scoring object. How do we use it? Well, call, there's a scoring, there's an epoch scoring callback. It needs the score object. You give it a name, and you have to set lower is better is false. Because for accuracy, higher is better. Okay? Now, you place this in the callback, and you could call fit. Same on the NumPy arrays. And now you have an additional column. It's like magic. You have validation accuracy as a column. Right? It's, it's nice. Now, you can, remember before I scaled x? Well, Cyclone has something to do to use to scale x. There's a min-max scaler. So you could put this into a pipeline called min-max scaler and pass it into the neural network, and it will just magically work with fit. All right, that's, a, that's very simple. You use, it, you use NumPy arrays and it works very nicely. Next, we have the ant versus bees data set. In this case, for images, normally images do not fit all in memory. So it, you can't use NumPy arrays. So you, how many are familiar with the data set API in PyTorch? It's very standard if you use PyTorch. Four people. <laughs> um, so, uh, and um, if you want, to, when you do images, it's good to do data augmentation. So, PyTorch provides utilities for this in the Torch Vision Library, which will do feature augmentation in this case. Which does in this for this one, we do a random crop. You flip it randomly and it'll normalize the data. In this case, we normalize it because we're going to use a pre-trained neural net. And to use a pre-trained neural net, we have to normalize our data to the mean and standard deviation of ImageNet, because our pre-trained neural network was trained on this. Very standard neural network stuff. <laughs> now, for this one, we're going to use the ResNet model. It's pretty old now. It's, it takes an input of input image of size three times two twenty four and outputs in our case a vector of size two, um, where zero represents ants and one versus represents bees. Now, to use Scorch, what's the first thing we do? We define a mo PyTorch module by subclassing. In this case, if you look closely, the model is using a pre-trained ResNet eighteen. And we're going to remove, exchange the fully connected layer at the very end with a, with a linear model that outputs a vector of size 2. Now, to do fine tuning on this model, we have to freeze the layers before the final layer. And Scorch provides a callback to do this. Um, it's called the freezer. In this case, we're going to freeze everything that does not start with the name model.fc, because the final layer ha has a name of model.fc. So this frees everything in blue and leaves the thing in red, the thing in red um, uh, open, for, open to update the weights for. Now, what other callbacks we have? We have learning rates, schedulers. We can have a learning rate schedule callback. In this case, we use this, we're going to step. We get, we're going to have a learning schedule that looks like this, where it starts high, and then we step down, and it keeps on going down. So at first, we train that. Yeah. Next, we have checkpoints. And checkpointing requires a, a score. In this case, we're going to use the accuracy score we had before. We, remember, the name is called validation accuracy. 
and our checkpoint object, which is a callback, needs a directory name to, for a place to store the, the model for, to, for checkpointing, and we need to tell it what to monitor. In this case, we wanted to monitor the validation accuracy, and you see how the, there's a name convention we have here. It's the validation accuracy underscore best. So this will only, this will save the model when the accuracy is maximum while training. So we have a lot of callbacks now. We could, what we do is place this all into a neural net object over here. And th the thing special about this is that we have a validation set that we already predefined. So if we want to have a predefined validation set in Scorch, we need to update the train split parameter, which takes the, a custom validation set. In this case, this validation DS is a PyTorch dataset object. Whew, okay. Um, now, we could call, now that we have defined the neural net object, we could call fit, and we have our custom validation accuracy. It's all on this, the dirt column, it's validation accuracy, and you can see there's a checkpoint column now. It tells you, it tells you the, a plus on the checkpoint column tells you when the model was saved. In this case, it's being trained all the way to 10 epochs, and it's saved at the eighth one. Uh, on a side note for the checkpoints, if you look at the folder that we, it creates, it saves three things by default. It saves the history, which is a JSON file, which is a machine-readable version of the history you just saw. It saves the optimizer state and the weight of your neural network. Now, because the neural network stopped at epoch 10, we need to load the neural network to epoch 8 because that was the best neural network that we've seen. So to do that, we have to call load params with that checkpoint that we saw before. And now we can call predict on it, and this will give you the validation predict, the predictions on the validation set on, with the best neural net that we've seen. Let's say you already fitted your model and you saved everything in a checkpoint. Now and you want to load it from this in another script. Um, you use the same checkpoint we had before. You define the neural net like we had before. But in this case, we have to call initialize. Because, initial, because if you look closely at the neural net object, the pre-trained model has not been instantiated yet. So to, if you want to instantiate it, it's, we have to call net that initialize, and then we could load the parameters from the checkpoint, and then call predict, call predict. Now, since Scorch supports data sets and NumPy arrays, we could have a NumPy array be passed into this predict. Even though this model was trained using the PyTorch dataset API, it also supports using NumPy as, as input to get predictions out of your neural net. Now remember that these predictions are the raw values of the neural net, so they're not normalized. They're just any real numbers between negative infinity and infinity. So to get a probability, we have to call softmax. Whew, okay, that's NumPy arrays. Next, the next problem, um, the data science bowl. It's a Kaggle, it's, the data science bowl was a Kaggle data science competition and it consists of images of cells where the, where the problem was to predict the position of the nuclei. If you do unsupervised learning on the images, you get to see that there's three different types of images. There's a purple, there's a black one, there's a white one, and the masks are just the nuclei. And if you want to use the dataset API for this, it's good to create a PyTorch dataset to subclass the PyTorch dataset and create your own dataset API, for, for this dataset class for this, which outputs tuples of the two images, one which is the cell image and another one, one which is the mask. So that's our dataset. And what neural network are we gonna train for this? We're gonna use the UNet neural network module. How many of you have heard of UNet? It's been around for like three years now. All right, so UNet, it goes through, it, it takes its input, in this case, a three by 288 image. It's gonna go 
it's going to get some features by going down and going up the ne um, this neural net, and it's going to output a mass. The very cool thing about this is that it retains spatial information by passing it straight down as the, the features are scaling up when it gets, as the feature scales up. Now, in this case, we would like to use pre-trained neural networks as well. So we do, we do this the standard freezing thing. We freeze these blue layers going down, and then we're going to allow the red layers to update, the weights of the red layers to update. How do we do this in Scorch? Well, there's a freezer, just like before. We could freeze uh, the, the layers that are, start with the, where the name of the module starts with conf, which I deliberately did that for our, my module. The, so the layers going down are called conf, and I'm going to freeze all those layers using a glob pattern. When training a new net, there's a very specific problem to, for training units, and they're very bad at the edges. Right? So to render, remember, remedy this problem, it's good to reflect the edges, create a padding around the edges, and reflect it. We do, the same, we do it for the image, and we also do it for the mask. So in this case, we're going to run the unit on this image and ignore the things on the, on the edges. Right? Um, what else is there about our data set? Our data set is not all squares. So we have to do, some, do, do patching on our data set. And sometimes our patching will overlap. In this case, it's very important that you don't use the same image in your training set and validation set when you do patching. So you, it would, it's, it's a good idea to split your images first and then patch. Very standard, I think, maybe. <laughs> um, then, since my data set API before, it only spits out tuples of just the raw image, I created, it's good to create another object to just do the patching, because it's very object-oriented. The first, the train cell DS just returns the images rawly. The patch one does the patching for you and does the magic of padding, it does random flipping, it, it does all the magic. And so that now your training data set and validation set all are pre-patched and works. A common metric for image segmentation is called the IOU metric. And IOU metric is the area of the overlap over the area of the union. And in this case, if the more the mass and the predicted mass overlaps, the greater its value, the better your, your neural network. Now, how do we create this metric in Scorch? Well, first we have to define the metric, which I didn't go into details here. You define a metric for the, which is the logic we had before, the, over, the overlap over the union. We call make score because we like calling make score. <laughs> we do it. We do the same thing we had before. We define an epoch scoring object. We have to set lower is false. Notice the name is called valid IO, underscore IOU. If you do the checkpointing, you, ha you have to set the monitor validation. You set the monitor to monitor the validation IOU underscore best. Notice uh, this this feature of having a directory name. This means that. You could, every time you change your neural network, all you have to do to enable checkpointing is just change this directory name so that it, you could track the experiments you're doing when you, ex when you experiment with many different neural networks. You just change the name of the checkpoint and it would do it automatically for you. It would checkpoint at different folders so that they don't overwrite each other. So it's very nice and beautiful. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's beautiful. Uh, next. Um, we need a loss function in this case, which, under, which understands that we're ignoring the padding, because we want to ignore the padding surrounding the images. So we have to define our own loss padding thing. In this case, it's binary cross NGP with logist loss padding. It's a great name. And um, it, when you initialize it, it needs the padding so that it knows when to ignore it. If you look at the input of neural nets, you see that the criteria is my custom loss function. And if I want to change the padding, it, it uses kind of very scikit-learn-esque using set params. So then in this case, we change, the, we change the padding parameter with double underscore equal to 16. This will be passed to the initialization of the BCE with logic loss padding class. <laughs> and this will all just work. 
And um, we define a unit, and this is the neural net object. Let's think about callbacks. Um, there's a, there's this callback system um, developed by Leslie Smith, popularized by Fast AI, and this is where you have a low learning rate, goes up to some higher learning rate, and goes back down. This is called cyclic learning rate. This was in PyTorch 1.1, and it's really nice. Um, it does, so this, we always, we support that already. Um, so we're gonna use this learning rate, we're gonna place our callbacks into the callbacks parameter. We're gonna have a predefined split like we had in the first example, have a batch size, um, define, tell it how many epochs to train, and there's a additional, there's additional, okay, there's additional, <laughs> there's additional parameters you could place to your data loader, and which will make your training faster. Who, who knows about the data loader API from the, the PyTorch? It's very common, yeah? Yeah, so in this case, internally, Scorch uses a data loader API with the data set API. So you can pass in the parameters you would pass to the data loader, data loader API into Scorch. So in this case, it's very customary to shuffle your training set, change the number of workers because um, remember before, we're doing data augmentation so that if you distribute your work between different workers, it, does a, it loads your data faster onto your GPU, it doesn't bottleneck it, you could, and it's, all, it's also nice to set pin memory to true, which means that the memory on the GPU is pinned so that it doesn't reallocate more memory every time you place things on the GPU. And you also do that on the validation set. Now if you call fit, um, it will output this lovely history. You can see that we have the validation IOU, which is um, on one column. We see that it checkpoints, the best checkpoint is at epoch 17, and it has a duration. This takes longer because there's a lot more things to optimize in this case. Not, not, a lot more weights to update in this case. Now, if you want to call predict on this, we, call, we load the checkpoint we could call predict, or just work. In this case, since it's binary, it's, we call sigmoid to get the mass. And then this is what the output looks like. The left-hand the left hand column is the true values. The, the things on the right is the, the original image, and the middle are the, are the predicted mass. So even when we're feeding data with, in this purple case, this black case, this white case, it all, it's able to learn where the nuclei is in this case. It's very nice. So, in closing, um, Scorch supports the FIT, the partial FIT API for continuing training. Predict, it could do separams and all work. It abstracts away the training loop. It has callbacks. We went through epoch scoring, freezer, checkpoint, learning rate scheduler. There's a bunch more you can check out at this link. Um, and I place all this stuff on Scorch on, my, on this repo, and which means you get to play with it. So this is on this repo, and if you click on any of these collab links, you could try out, it will download the data set. If you run the cells um, sequentially, it will download the data set. You could try out the API without having a GPU, and it, it's very nice. Like All these examples are on collab, and you could play with the API. And if you have any issues, you um, put it, you know, put it on the issue board. <laughs> and we, yeah, that's the talk. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, any questions for Thomas? So does Scorch allow for, so I saw you train on GPUs and I saw num workers floating around there. Does it allow support for working with multiple GPUs? Um, if, if you put your, I think PyTorch, you could wrap a PyTorch module with this thing that supports um, multiple GPUs and you could just place that as a module and it just, in my experience it works, so. But I don't, I've never tried it with multiple computers. <laughs> You have to do it on one computer and it works. Like, is it the data parallel loader in, Py, in PyTor PyTorch? Scorch is a very light wrapper around PyTorch. So everything you could do in PyTorch, you could basically do in Scorch. It's very thin wrapper. Yeah. Uh. Thanks. Any questions for Thomas? 
Hi, great talk. When should I avoid Scorch? When is it the wrong choice? When should I use PyTorch instead? What's the beginning of the question? When should I avoid Scorch? When should how you avoid Scorch? How is Scorch bad? And, and when should you use PyTorch instead? And when should you use PyTorch instead? You're always using PyTorch if you're using Scorch. <laughs> well, but, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> unbridled PyTorch. Um, the, you, if you really want, it's, PyTorch is very customizable. Like, like I have not had a use case where, am I marrying? Okay, I'm marrying. Um, if, when I'm, there's, in our documentation, we have implement, we have in our tutorials, can you see this, I guess? Yeah. We have used PyTorch, and we have used Scorch in many different situations. And we've done it, it's been used with Dask, it's been used with language modeling, it's been used with sequence to sequence. So I haven't found a situation where you can't use Scorch if you could do it in PyTorch. If you could do it in PyTorch, you could do it in Scorch. <laughs> Uh, what about early stopping in, in the training loop? Oh, yeah. That's the thing I often take advantage of. Um, like, I lower the learning rate and... Um, know, early stopping. Um, there's, there's a, oh, I haven't navigated this anymore. Um, it's, we have a callback for early stopping. That, <laughs> it, 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 I, I, I could find it. <laughs> but... Shoot. But, um, we do have a callback for early stopping. It, it's... <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right, if not, let's thank Thomas and the rest of the speakers.